Well, hello and welcome to episode 110 of the Market Maker podcast. And it's very much going to be a tech titan earnings focus. Um, barring Apple, which doesn't come out till next week, we have had the likes of Meta, Microsoft, Alphabet, and Amazon have all come out this week. And we're going to dive into each individual company, talk about some of the good, the bad, and is there any ugly, maybe a few hidden spots we can highlight for sure. But Piers, why don't we kick off with um, Meta? We've always given them a bit of a hard time, as has the market over the recent, I guess, 12 months at least. Um, but they've had a phenomenal comeback year to date. And then they've topped it off with a 10% response after their earnings report came out. So thoughts on that? Yeah, a new new highs. I mean, uh, the share price, I mean, this this year has just been quite phenomenal. Well, if you actually take it further back, they kind of they 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 bottomed out in November of last year. Okay, share price eighty seven and a half dollars, eighty seven and a half. Now clocking in at two hundred and thirty eight. Um, you can do the quick math on that, but that's like tripling your share price in six months, less than six months. I mean, so that kind of gives you an indication of what what's going on, and obviously. This is coming off an incredibly depressed low. They've had, if you go back over the last few years or couple of years, let's just say, if you take it from like the summer of 2021, let's say to the end of 2022, was the worst 18 months in Zuckerberg's Facebook story, like literally from, from, from the start where the wheels came off. Of course, don't forget it was a bag. Um, several factors kind of, several speed bumps let's call them um so obviously facebook when you think about metal you still think facebook don't forget they own instagram and whatsapp and so on but you know their 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 kind of original product facebook was considered to be a bit of a, a kind of dying um app in terms of usage as you know tiktok and snap kind of take over the the kind of youth um of this world so that that it was thought that they were a bit of a dinosaur and they hadn't ad adapted apple changed the settings, the privacy settings on the iPhone, which meant that Facebook's, that, that directly impacted um, Facebook's uh, ability to generate advertising revenue, which of course is the majority of the money that they have coming in, um, and a few other bits and bobs, right? And then Zuckerberg's kind of seemingly obsessive kind of stance in terms of um, wanting to win the, uh, the race for the metaverse which of course doesn't exist and maybe it won't exist and who knows and it's way off in the future and investors can't see that far. And he was pumping so much money into that initiative that investors thought he'd just taken his eye off the ball. The current business wasn't being run very well and it's all just about this pipe dream in the future. And so the, the share price got, got absolutely slammed, of course. And when I say slammed, summer of 2021, $380, all-time high, $380. Yeah, bottoming at 80 um, and in November last year. But look, they're back. And I think the, the earnings call this week and the earnings generally have proven um, that the year of efficiency, which is um, what Zuckerberg is calling the kind of restructuring, you might as well call it, right, where they're kind of, you know, uh, they've laid off 20,000 people. Um, the strategy is to... To what's called flatten the management structure. So loads of redundancies, you know, a little bit more, you know, focus on costs and spend. And so his year of efficiency, I guess you could say, is off to a better start than we had thought. And I think the corner has officially been turned. And whilst the share price has rocketed, I mean, it's still, it's still well over a hundred bucks off that high from back in 2021. And I think that. Yeah, he's had 18 months of wobble, and now he's back on track. Yeah, there's a few different elements here, because there's the daily active, monthly active users numbers, which on the daily side came in above expectations. Again, these numbers are just crazy when you hear them. 2.04 billion. <laughs> and sorry, did you say that's daily active? Daily active users. Across all, is that across all their apps? That's Facebook. That's just Facebook. Wow. Oh, yeah. Who uses don't, Facebook? Don't, well, don't forget that we're sat here in the UK. Yeah. If you're in the US, you might think, yeah, it's a bit of a dying horse. 
Yeah. But for rest of world. Yeah. <laughs> they're still very much users of that platform uh, yeah. amongst other things. But so the other thing was ad impressions. So the way they packaged this up when they deliver their earnings, as they call this, the ad impressions deliver across the family of apps is how they refer to it. And that increased by 26% year over year. Um, but the average price per ad did decrease, though, about 17% year over year. But an interesting point within that was they were talking about how, and this will be a very common theme throughout this episode, how artificial intelligence technology helped the company choose the right type of short form content, i.e. reels. And they were talking up this idea of how AI has improved basically their algorithm as to what is best to push to the user to increase the stickiness on the platform. And the better that, more efficient that process is, the more you can advertise to people. And yeah. that's how they're utilizing that technology. But to give it some context, Meta said they're making more money from reels and time spent on Instagram has gone up by 24%. I mean, that's yeah. huge, that number. Sounds yeah. huge. Don't have much context, to be honest, but that sounds like a lot. Well, that's, yeah, I've got a few highlight bullet points, notes on Facebook or Meta's kind of earnings. A lot, a lot here, but the one I highlighted in red, as in easily the standout stat of the whole thing was exactly what you just said. AI-driven recommendations and boosted time spent on Instagram by 24%. That's, that's kind of blown my mind, that. And um, I think I think obviously AI you know, 2020, quarter one of 2023 will always forever be the kind of uh, the start of the race, like proper. Obviously, people have been building AI stuff for years and years, right? But this quarter is officially, you know, chat GPT is officially, you know, the, the, the gun has been fired and we are off. And so AI is all over these earnings calls, of course, and everyone wants to talk about it. And what Zuckerberg was saying that, I mean, he kind of was trying to justify in some sense, the big, what you might consider overspend over the last few years, which was one of the key catalysts for that big sell off in that Facebook, um, in the meta stock, but he was trying to defend it by saying that we were, he said that we were behind, kind of on building out our AI um, platform. But he said, you know, we spent a lot of money over the last couple of years trying to cut, catch up on that. And now, actually, not only have we caught up, he thinks that they're in a position of strength uh, moving forwards. And he was saying that, um, you know, deploying AI tools to make his, uh, the platform more engaging, uh, to make advertising more effective, and then also on the cost side to streamline internal processes. And there's stuff like, because... Um, he was saying around generative AI, he thinks he's in a really strong position. And what you, we can expect to see, you know, I would say in 2023, as the months roll on, is, is, is more on this. But he's talking about generative AI tools to help brands create more personalized ads more quickly, more easily. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously, their, their business is a, they're an advertising business, right? So... Um, the more time you can get your user to spend on your app, obviously, tick, 24% up on Instagram, amazing. And then obviously, whilst when they're on it, right, how effective are the adverts that you present to them in terms of click-throughs? Um, so it looks like, looks like they're back on track, um, meta. Yeah, um, and that so generative AI part, it almost feels like they're absorbing then some of the other um players within that normal advertising process so if you talk about graphic designers you talk about graphic agencies marketing agencies it's like facebook saying look we've got the tech that can bypass all of that it makes actually for the client side cheaper you're getting more yeah. bang for your buck but the money basically is now being swooped up swept up from all those other people who used to be part of that and they're just claiming it so yeah, it's, it's interesting it's, and it's and we'll talk about this with some of the other earnings but obviously you know tech has done amazingly well in 2023 okay and they the big big tech particularly has you know what massively outperformed the underlying indices like the s p 500 
But of course, and generally speaking, these earnings that we've had this week, generally speaking, have been very positive and have really surprised to the upside. And it's like, you know, we weren't expecting too much sort of growth from them and actually they've delivered it. And it's like, so it's it's saying, well, this whole idea around a US recession hasn't, hasn't started yet. The recession, there are no signs of the recession. And so what we want to know is, well, what about, you know, when is this recession going to happen? Is it going to happen? How bad is it going to be? Um, and I think that, you know, generally speaking, in recessions, it's the companies that are reliant on their advertising revenue, you know, so Google and, and Meta, right? Um, they're the most vulnerable. They're, they're a bit more cyclical because as a business, you know, going through a recession, of course, you're cutting costs, you know, all businesses now. And one of the one of the easier ones to cut is your spend on advertising. But if if Meta here can present tools that reduces the cost of your ability mm-hmm. to present an ad to your potential customer by cutting out the ad agency cost, which is substantial, right? Then, mm-hmm. then yeah, maybe maybe these platforms can be less cyclical in terms of being less impacted by a recession downturn. Um, so it's interesting. Yeah, and just to kind of wrap up the the meta story, they did actually issue a bullish outlook for Q2 revenues. They're looking at a range of 29 and a half to 32 billion. This is very typical of what they do. They issue a range. That was against a street estimate of 29.5 billion. And then the other things were meta labs. That, that was kind of what you referred to as in the metaverse. Now that's still making a substantial loss, 3.99 billion. That was a deeper loss than expected actually. But kind of like what you said when he said that we were behind, Mark Zuckerberg, we were behind on AI. And, he, and it, it, I think there's something to be said for someone who then goes, who says that sort of thing. Yeah. It's no excuses. Like we were behind. And then here, what actually I kind of like is that the word metaverse doesn't appear until the boilerplate forward looking statement section at the very bottom of their earnings report, which for him, I'm sure just, just parking that idea is a big blow, I'm sure, to his ego. And so the fact that he's done that. <laughs> yeah. Although he did ex- expressly um, mention it on the earnings call, he did, he did yeah. very, you know, deliberately make the point that you know, yes, all this AI stuff, yeah, 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 whatever, that's all anybody cares about now. He did say the metaverse is very much still a key part of his, you know, core strategy going forwards. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if he can manage the the costs yeah. of that and just play the long game, very much sure the metaverse will become a very dominant revenue stream and I'm sure they will be in a very strong position. Yeah, interesting if they can flip that advertising situation. But yeah, so that's meta. Let's move on and talk about Microsoft. Okay. It's the one that everyone's been kind of getting excited about for the obvious reasons of chat GPT initially and then what's come thereafter. So a couple of things. They beat on their earnings per share. Their revenues exceeded expectations. Intelligent cloud business segment beat expectations productivity, business process segment, beat expectations. It need I go on, basically. Um, one of the other areas here, notably, was search advertising revenues. They were also up 13% and up dramatically as Bing yeah. integrated chat GPT. I must admit, actually, I'd been on Bing not that many times, to be honest, but I would say over the course of the last month of April, now we're at the end of the month, I'd say I've been on Bing about 10 times. And each time I've used the chat function just to play around with it. So, and my my behavior was, I would never have dreamed of going on Bing before. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, interestingly, I have not been on Bing once. But, and that the, for the reason being that why go on Bing when you can just go straight to open AI and 
openai.com and get on chat GPT directly. Um, that's, uh, that's my behavior. So I'm using chat GPT and still just using Google for search, right? But I'd say my Google searching has definitely reduced for sure, but it hasn't transferred to Bing. It's just gone straight to the... Right, so what I Mac. was testing out was that Bing is running OpenAI's chat GPT-4 rather than... Ah, is it? So okay, I, I didn't wanted to see like, what's the difference. The actual um, UI is a little bit different. It's a bit cleaner, a bit nicer. I actually like the 80s retro feel of the original OpenAI platform, to be fair, just because I'm old. <laughs> uh, hang on, because chat GPT-4, if you go straight to OpenAI, you pay for that, right? It's 20 bucks a month to get the premium access. But are you saying that you can actually get use it for free on, on Bing? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure how they package the... the um... The subscription, yeah, I know it's like what twenty bucks if you're getting like the pro version on. It's twenty dollars a month, yeah, yeah. All right, I'll so, go yeah, and check I it mean, out. That would make sense, right? From a okay, we are a major investor in this company. However, we're the, by far the boss here, and the traffic's got to come our way. We will help yeah. fuel your technological build of that product. Yeah. But I mean, for like, our purpose. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, going back to their earnings, of course, like on the earnings call, of course, all anybody wanted to talk about was, you know, chat GPT and mm. how amazing it is. And, and so obviously, uh, Nadella, you know, um, Microsoft um, CEO was saying that, well, actually, interestingly, because their earnings numbers were really strong, but he actually said AI capabilities were not a big driver. Yeah, it's too early. Q yeah, right. Um, but what he did say was that the company is now, I'm quoting here, the company is now having conversations we never had with clients who are keen to leverage AI. And he, he made the obvious point that Microsoft are particularly well positioned at the very start of a new cycle, uh, we feel we have a good lead and we have differentiated offerings up, down the stack. <laughs> That's how he described it. So obviously, I mean, yeah, this is all in the future, right? All this chat GPT lead they have hasn't touched their, their earnings really at all at this point. Um, I know that OpenAI are now charging. There is a premium kind of subscription offering. So Got no idea what the kind of numbers are on that in terms of because they've got who knows now, but like I know it was a hundred million users, wasn't it? Um, on chat GPT on the obviously mostly on the free, the free version. Um, but I don't know what the usage numbers are. I think that 100 million stat that's at least a month old now, so I assume that's continued to rise. But I don't know what I think they've been quiet and haven't revealed what proportion of those users have actually flipped to being the you know premium subscribers but um but look you know obviously that's all very positive for the future um but yeah i mean the numbers then just forget ai were still pretty impressive and obviously we we often look towards the cloud division of of actually a lot of these big tech we're talking about the big techs here and certainly at microsoft and amazon are the leaders when it comes to cloud computing, Azure on the Microsoft side, AWS on Amazon side. And um, it's always like the, at least it always has been the kind of fastest growing part of these two giant businesses. So everyone always looks towards the cloud figures first. So um, on the Azure side, that division climbed 16%, which was better than expected. Um, and like there were fears, again, back to this idea around, we were talking earlier about advertising and how that's vulnerable in a downturn well if you if you when you're talking about microsoft and amazon it's like well cloud services are potentially vulnerable in a downturn with companies kind of reducing costs and cloud computing costs being one of those items that companies might might go to um so this is why these numbers again were evidence that the recession has not has definitely not started um and so much better than expected figures and and yeah that that slow down in spending that we're maybe worried about might happen def definitely hasn't started yet
Mm. Okay, well let, let's um, let's t- go into Alphabet and tie some of those concepts up with because Google Cloud revenue and, and so forth and advertising just very much paramount to Alphabet when we talk Google. Their total ad revenue fifty four and a half billion exceeded expectations. YouTube revenues, which I think has taken a bit of a hit recently, they actually beat as well. Their cloud revenue actually did miss ever so slightly, though. A um, couple of other highlights in their numbers. A $2.6 billion charge related to layoffs, office space reductions during mm. the quarter. That decommissioning yeah. cost, sunk costs right there. Yeah. <laughs> and then the board authorized a $70 billion share buyback as well and i'm sure that's not the first time they've done that to just yeah well it up a little yeah well exactly they were i was just looking back they announced the 70 billion dollar share buyback pretty much exactly a year ago today um so yeah they're repeating that that trick um the trick that really i guess was pioneered by apple pioneered in the sense of relentlessly buying back hundreds of billions of dollars of your stock. Well, I guess not quite hundreds in the case of Google, but, you know, 70 billion a year, like bang, every year, every year, bang, 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 buying stock back, buying stock back, buying stock back, which of course means, you know, it's one great way of boosting your profit. Because when we talk about profit, we don't just talk about how many dollars profit did you make? It's what was your earnings per share? Hmm. And if there are less shares, well, then your earnings per share goes up. So it's just juicing that that bottom line. Um, and Apple, they're just geniuses at it. And they've got, you know, obviously you need cash to pull it off. So you obviously got to have a phenomenal business that just, you know, generates cash like it's going out of fashion, and like too much cash. And so you've got to, got to spend it somewhere, right? So yeah, Google, you know, and we'll see that again next year. I mean, absolutely, you know, this time next year, look out for the 70 billion um, being pumped in just quietly. Yeah, so it's a trick these big giant tech firms have um, been 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 deploying for, for, for quite a while. But yeah, I mean, look, look at their, their, their numbers. I, I guess Google, out of all these ones we're talking about, I would say are the underperformers, which is, you know, talk, looking back over the last sort of 12, 15 months, underperformers in the sense of like their share price. Obviously, you know, they're facing a bit of an existential threat, which they've never, ever had in their entire history in the shape of chat GPT. And, you know, does that genuinely threaten their search business, which, of course, is is the giant um, revenue generator. So look, it's quite interesting that Google are in this, they're, they're, they're certainly not used to it, right? They're in this space where it's like, ah, okay, we actually do have a challenger. Um, perhaps we need to kind of step up. So looking at the share prices, like of all of the all of these big tech stocks, then Google's is the laggard um, in terms of its rebound, like this year, for example, we were talking about Facebook or Meta, I should say, kind of tripling. I mean, that's it's a harsh, it's a harsh uh, sort of comparison because face uh, Meta was coming off such a depressed low, but like Meta's stock has tripled in the last six months, right? Whereas Google's has gone from about well, about eighty five. The low in November was eighty five bucks, and we're trading up at one hundred and seven now, which is percentage wise, it's still good, yeah, right? What's the, what's the S and P over this period? Oh, percentage wise, it's a good question, actually. I'll uh, I'll compute that in a second. But you know, it's still outperformed the S and P, I would guess. Mm. But it's underperformed its peers, is yeah. is my point. And certainly, when you're looking back to the the highs back in 2021, yeah, you know, Google's still a, a fair ways off that. So look, it's just had a yeah, it's just been challenged for the first time in its history. Um, and so what I, one of the interesting things just outside of their numbers and stuff was the move, um, I think it was this week or maybe it was last week now, um, clearly they're, they've been surprised. ChatGPT and obviously therefore Microsoft have really pulled a fast one here. 
and they've come out of the gate. As I said, the gun has been fired and, and Microsoft are out of the gate miles ahead. So they've made a bit of a move here. So Google used to have, it's such a behemoth of a business. And whilst they're spending a lot of cash on buybacks, they're also spending a huge amount of cash on lots of kind of moonshot kind of projects and ideas. Um, and DeepMind is one of these, right? DeepMind is the AI business that they bought um, for $400 million um, back in 2014. And very much the, um, the so, the, so the guy who, the founder of DeepMind, um, Demis Hassabis. Um, so they're, they're a London-based business. Um, it, when, when, micro, when Google bought them, it was very much the deal that, you know, the only, Hassabis only did the deal on the premise that they were kind of largely left alone. Like, yes, you can buy us, but we are going to continue to develop software that's as intelligent as a human being. And we're going to do it in our way. We're going to do it without a remit of having to build certain products and monetize those products and generate, you know, dirty stuff like revenue and profit. He was like, that's not me. We are going to, you know, do this. You know, he was almost like a non, non-profit type mindset, this guy, right? And largely they've been left alone. Because of that, Google in parallel set up um, what well, there's the department they call Google Brain, which is based in California. And that's the kind of that's again AI, right? But very much commercial minded um sort of remit. Um and so they've had these two divisions running pretty much separately, you know, in parallel. What's happened last week is they've merged them. This is a really big deal. Um, because, as I said, there's been quite a lot of rivalry internally between these two departments, and they've gone, you know what, Microsoft is so far ahead, enough, we need to stop pandering to your internal politics, we're going to make a move here. And they've mashed these two together, with Hassabis being the head of both. And so it's definitely ruffled a lot of feathers on the Google brain side, um, but they're calling this now Google DeepMind, okay, the, the, the merged departments. It's going to be headquartered out of London, which is a pretty we've, – mm. we've been London bashing on yeah. this podcast for quite a long time. But actually, this is a bit of a coup um, and, and really maybe puts London back on the map in terms of, you know, being up right at the kind of cutting edge of the AI kind of evolution. But, um, yeah, I thought it's just an interesting move. And – and – the deal here, Hassabis has said, right, I will head up these two departments. But Larry Page has said, basically, the only way this is going to work is you're going to have to give up some of this sort of um, non-profit type mindset. This department is now having a commercial, commercially minded um, direction. And so they are to build AI, general AI systems that are going to make money for Google. And they need to compete with Microsoft and they're behind. And so this is Google's first kind of major move, I would say, to start to kind of get back in the race. Mm. Wonder what the timeline, though, is for that type of development. But I guess if the two haven't been working in unison, perhaps yeah. there's a media crossover advantages that would happen as a synergy to create, you know, fast track that process. But yeah, definitely interesting to watch. I wasn't aware of that. So Amazon, to finish... Yeah. Um, their shares jumped about 12%. It's funny because I actually put a post out, you know, the name of the game is get it out quick. Out the door it went. And then I looked, I was like, ping, my phone went off like half an hour later because the conference call generally is a bit later. And someone had left a comment on my post like going, you bozo, look at the shares now. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh no, what's happened? And you you Jeff like, bozo. Yeah, they just got crushed in the conference call they went up from 12 that then down negative then they kind of flattened out pretty much um so yeah talking about let's talk about the positives first and then we'll talk about the negatives so from a numbers perspective um earnings per share beat um their aws division beat and advertising probably saw the biggest margin of clearance over wall street estimates a um, couple of comments there so this is the CEO, Andy Jassy. He said, our advertising business continues to deliver robust growth, largely due 
to our ongoing machine learning investments that help customers see relevant information when they engage with us, which in turn delivers unusually strong results for brands. So again, jumping on the, the AI bandwagon, and in fact, mentioning the phrase AI six times in the earnings release and the full phrase of artificial intelligence twice. So eight. <laughs> so <laughs> in order to yeah, play a bit of that catch up, um, as opposed to some of the other names like Microsoft, these guys are just absolutely <clears throat> trying to scream and shout about it as much as possible. Uh, it's all anybody yeah. cares about. It's mm -hmm. Literally, or investors, they're so... Uh, I don't know, single-minded or the, or they just have a complete inability to focus on more than one thing at once, basically. And, and basically, they don't care about any, like Meta, go briefly back to Mecca, Meta's earnings. You know, all the AI chat was amazing and great, ah, excellent. Slide in the, the spend on Metaverse has gone up. Like 12 months ago, that's what sent the stock down 25% in like a heartbeat, right? So the kind of same kind of message, but no one cares. Um, but but yeah, I mean, AI, what, what was interesting for me in Amazon's report, because as you said, stock up 12%, ping, and that's because their numbers were great, right? Nine percent. Their numbers are quite incredible as well. Like out of all of them, Amazon make the most money in terms of revenue, okay? So 127.4 billion um, in the quarter. Uh, so that was up 9%. I mean, that's quite remarkable. Mean, let's just stand back and applaud. You've got, when your revenue is above 100 billion in a quarter and you can still grow it at nearly double digits, it's, it's, quite, it's quite remarkable. But anyway, half of that, roughly, well, less than actually, is from their online stores. So that is something to note. Their online stores, which is what you know Amazon as, right, in terms of a, a user, um, mostly you're on Amazon buying stuff or maybe you're, you know, on Amazon Prime or whatever. Um, but that was 51.1 billion for the quarter, which was flat. That didn't grow, okay? Um, but that's now, yeah, quite a bit less than half of the revenue, which is just showing how, Amazon's diversification, you know, away from just that online store has now got to the point it's now less than half of their revenue. And it's the, obviously the lowest profit margin by, by a long way compared to the other stuff they're doing. Like AWS is their big profit generator, very high profit margins. AWS generated 21.4 billion. Um, so yeah, it makes up, well, very roughly about 20% of their of their total revenues now. But, um, you know, obviously, so their numbers are great, right? Stock up um, 12%. But Amazon said something that kind of contradicts what we were hearing from the others, because their share price then dropped all the way back to almost flat. And basically, they said, in terms of their guidance going forwards, customers continue to evaluate ways to optimize their cloud spending in response to the, these tough economic conditions. Uh, and we're seeing these optimizations continue into the second quarter with April revenue growth, growth rates about 500 basis points lower than what we saw in quarter one. So Amazon are the only ones that from their guidance of outlook for quarter two have indicated that maybe this recession is beginning, we're beginning to see signs of it. It's just odd that none of the others really mentioned this and their guidance was quite positive. So I don't know whether Amazon are the only ones being honest or actually Amazon's business is underperforming because Microsoft, direct comparison, Microsoft's Azure, right? They, Microsoft weren't guiding that quarter two is looking weaker. But they didn't guide that. But then Amazon did. So I don't know. I don't know who to believe. Because both of their cloud businesses, their revenues increased weirdly the same amount. So they were both up 16% in quarter one. Amazon guided negatively for next quarter and Microsoft didn't. So maybe that's the it's, big anomaly. Um, I mean, chat GPT has been out for a while now. Yeah. Um, and so maybe then the association of that yeah. technology overall has created um, 
a degree of marginal shift yeah from one cloud provider to another uh, i know these point. things aren't easy but because i know that amazon brought out is it bedrock i think is their their ai department or or the the team that they've put together i think that's the the product but they are they are last in that race at yeah. the moment and so perhaps it's just some of that people the early birds jumping ship i don't know just yeah to... but amazon so i mean look you can this whole ai thing right you can you can play it in so many different ways i think what amazon was saying on their call is you know we're, we're perhaps not in the race like at the coal face like a chat gpt type thing but they're developing um, microchips. They they think they're going to be in the race on the chip side. Obviously, this AI revolution is going to require, you know, several of all orders of magnitude greater computing power, right? And you need chips to be able to pull that off. And Amazon have got uh, their kind of chip development. It looks like they're on course to take advantage of that. Um, so while you were talking, this, this this really goes to show this whole conversation. <laughs> so I quickly jumped on um, Google. So I jumped on Google right, to yes. search for the Amazon press release about Bedrock and yeah. then slung it in to Microsoft's OpenAI to summarize <laughs> what is a 5,000-word document. <laughs> so I've gone from Google to <laughs> Amazon's page, then over to OpenAI, Microsoft, to, to figure <laughs> this out. So yeah, they're talking. So they, they've got a number of things going on, actually, Amazon. SageMaker, Feature Store, Jumpstart, Studio. These are tools designed to make it easier for developers to build, train, and deploy generative AI models. Right. Um, the blog post also highlights benefits of using these tools, faster development cycles, lower costs, improve accuracy. Um, overall, focusing on the advance, advancements made by AWS, to enable developers to build their own powerful gener generative AI applications. So, yeah. But yeah, yeah. kind of. <laughs> well, and actually an insight, another insight I've just remembered, because um, we use AWS mm. right? as a business. Um, we use Amazon's cloud. Mm -hmm. Now we've been using that for years, right? And something happened this quarter I think I can't remember exactly when it was like back in January or maybe it was February now. I can't remember. Um, something happened that's never happened before. And it happened. I was like, wow, that's, that's kind of amazing. I wonder why. And what happened was Amazon basically called us, got in touch and said, we would like to provide you with a service of seeing how you can reduce your AWS costs. We got called by AWS to help us reduce how much money we give them. And it was like, wow, what? what? Okay, that, that to me mm. was a clear indication that they are really worried about what you've just said, which is people jumping to Azure because Microsoft have got, got ahead in this, this kind of AI race. Mm. Yeah, um, it's like the most- so They're actively wanting, yeah, wanting to engage with customers. Look, we got your back. Look, let's help you reduce your spend. Mm. Uh, you know well you I know that when, was I see, very interesting. when i see bezos rolling out his um what is it half a billion dollar new yacht coming out <laughs> of the port like yeah <laughs> uh, yeah cool all right well look, let's wrap it up there thanks very much for your time as ever Piers. thanks everyone for listening and also don't forget to check out the career series the final episode of that um, the third installment comes out on Wednesday next week. So just giving you the date, that will be the 3rd of May from when we're recording this. And yeah, that really great episode to wrap it up. Probably my favorite of the three. I'm speaking to John Norman, who's a super experienced guy. He worked at UBS, the World Bank. He was an MD at JP for 25 years. The final one's a good one. If you're a student looking to get into finance, you cannot miss that one. So Make sure that you subscribe to the channel, follow, hit the bell icon, and you'll get a notification as soon as it goes live on, on the 3rd of May. But yeah, have a great weekend. If you're in the UK, enjoy the long weekend. If you're a student studying, don't stress out too much. Um, you're going to nail it, so don't worry. But yeah, take care. Thanks, Piers. 
Have a good weekend.